Hello, I'm Brandon House, and welcome to the broadcast. Tonight, I'd like to present to you a 90-minute television special entitled The Globalist Siege on Freedom. The subtitle is Exposing Their Religious and Political Plan to Destroy the Centers and Usher in Global Tyranny. In 2019, I produced an eight-and-a-half-hour documentary entitled Siege. Tonight, I'd like to present to you 90 minutes of it. Normally, I make my living in part by selling my docu-movies. But as with Brainwashed America Part 1, I'm releasing this 90 minutes tonight for everyone to watch for free. Why? Because we are at such a serious crossroads in America and in the world. We must educate as many people as we can to the threats to our constitutional republic the threats to our freedom of speech, our freedom of religion, our private property, our very way of life. We can keep this behind a paywall, as we have done. We can sell it on DVD for $29.99, as we have done. Or I can pull out 90 minutes, as I'm doing tonight, and share it with you and ask you to share it with everyone you know. Why? Because as we learn from our series on brainwashing, the kryptonite to any propaganda information campaign is the truth. There are so many Americans and people around the world that don't understand what's happening, nor do they understand why. Therefore, they don't understand how to respond. Tonight's broadcast, 90 Minutes, is fast-paced. I present many experts, Alex Newman, Tom DeWeese, Dr. Mark Musser, and others. It's vital that you disseminate this all over the world. But how is it that we're able to pay for the bandwidth? Because we have to pay every time someone watches this. If we're giving this away versus selling it, how are we going to make up for that budget for WVW Broadcast Network? Well, like Brainwashed America and our documentary Absolute Proof, we're going to use the model that's working because of you. You can support us in one of three ways. One, you can make a tax-deductible contribution at WVWFoundation.com. Throughout the documentary, you'll find our mailing address and website on the screen. You can make a tax-deductible contribution at that mailing address. You can also donate online. And if you prefer to give by phone, you can call during normal business hours and make a donation. The second way is by going to MyPillow.com and using the promo code WVW. This will save you up to 66% on over 100 products offered by Mike Lindell. He gives a generous portion back to our broadcast network. Look, you likely need pillows, sheets, towels, different things, right? You're going to use them anyway. You're going to consume those. They're going to get old. you got kids going to college, whatever it might be. Make some purchases there. Support his 2,600 employees. And again, a generous portion of each purchase comes back to our broadcast network. Spread that far and wide, won't you? WVW is the promo code to use when you go to MyPillow.com. The third way you can support us is by joining our on-demand club, the Situation Room. Many people, many organizations, put all of their program behind a paywall. You can only see it if you pay for it. We, on the other hand, have done the exact opposite. We put it out in front for everyone to watch, and then it rolls behind our paywall after a period of time. Again, this is a big part of our general operating budget. So if you appreciate what you've been seeing from us, Please understand, there are years, there are years worth of programming at situationroom.net. You could also join at wvwtv.com slash subscription, wvwtv.com slash subscription, and have access to literally thousands and thousands of radio shows, TV shows, transcripts, and more. You can join at a monthly rate, a yearly rate, two-year rate, or three-year rate. So my friends, these are the three ways you can support us. WVWFoundation.com, MyPillow.com, and use the promo code WVW, or join our subscription club where we archive years worth of programming and research by going to WVWTV.com slash subscription. The more you support us, the more free programming we endeavor to put out so we can educate all Americans and everyone around the world to defend life and liberty. And now the 90-minute feature the globalist siege on freedom. As we learned in part two of Siege, the docu-movie, 
Beginning aggressively in the 1940s, cultural Marxists and advocates of socialism openly discussed how they would use what they called propaganda to brainwash the American people. Their openly stated goal was to weaponize psychology and deem as mentally ill anyone that disagreed with their quest for bigger government, redistribution of wealth, and opposition to communism. In part three of this docu-movie, you will learn how they also plan to use psychology to characterize as mentally ill anyone that opposes globalism and defends national sovereignty. And if you dare to disagree with their lie of man-made global warming as an apocalyptic event, they might even charge you with a crime. Some of the millions of people around the world who do not believe man is responsible for global warming could soon be facing more than just mockery from the left. President Obama's top lawyer admits the government is considering much more forceful action. Chief Washington correspondent James Rosen tonight on the growing campaign against politically incorrect thinking. Testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee, Attorney General Loretta Lynch said Wednesday the Obama administration has directed federal law enforcement to investigate whether big oil companies and other so-called climate change deniers should face civil racketeering prosecution. Under President Obama, the Department of Justice has done nothing so far about the climate denial scheme. Any federal action against opponents of the administration on climate change issues would evoke parallels with the IRS scandal of 2013 when it was disclosed that officials at Internal Revenue back in early 2010 had targeted conservative and Tea Party groups for additional scrutiny in their applications for tax exempt status. You will also hear exclusive audio clips from an international conference on globalism in which the speakers refer to conservatives Christians and patriotic Americans as demons, neurotic, a threat to society, promoters of white supremacy and promoters of a slave economy. We will also examine how the socialist and globalist are using environmentalism through what is called sustainable development to destroy free market capitalism, which is built on private property rights. Sadly, their ideology is very similar to that of Hitler's Third Reich and his Nazi ecology that led to the death of six million Jews and five million non-Jews. Part three of Siege, the documentary begins right now. This is a Brandon House and WVW Broadcast Network documentary. See the clear and present dangers pushing America to the brink of a Marxist Islamic revolution, civil war, World War III, and globalism. And now, here is your host, Brennan House. Worldwide social justice is another name for global socialism or global governance. Stabilizing world population for the environmental globalist means abortion on demand, population control, eugenics, and active euthanasia through socialized medicine that allows for rationing of healthcare. In order for these radical ideas to be implemented by the socialist and the Marxist, they need to target the educational system and media with social justice propaganda, also known as environmental justice. As far back as 1948, plans were being laid to use the psychological manipulation of behavior modification to coerce individuals to give up their commitment to individual rights, the free market system, and national sovereignty in favor of world citizenship. In 1948, the National Association for Mental Health declared, quote, Principles of mental health cannot be successfully furthered in any society unless there is progressive acceptance of the concept of world citizenship. World citizenship can be widely extended among all peoples through the applications of the principles of mental health. At a major turning point in world history, there is an obligation of social scientists and psychiatrists to attempt this new formulation, end quote. If you do not willingly give up your commitment to the free market system and your opposition to socialism and the social gospel, then you are being rigid and divisive, according to them. 
which only proves you're mentally ill, or at least very close to it. Harry Overstreet, chair of Department of Philosophy and Psychology at City College of New York, wrote in 1952, quote, through clinical experience, we have come to recognize one invariable characteristic of that sick condition of the mind we call neurosis, namely rigidity. The rigidity is found in several areas. In each of these, we can predict that the individual will respond with trigger quickness and in exactly the same way. Sometimes it appears such persons have constellation of prejudice areas. A man, for example, may be angrily against race equality, public housing, the TVA, financial and technical aid to backward countries, organized labor, and the preaching of social rather than salvational religion. Try as we may, we can scarcely open up a subject that does not tap their primitive automatic againstness. Such people may appear normal in the sense that they are able to hold a job and otherwise maintain their status as members of society. But they are, we now recognize, well along the road toward mental illness." End quote. Globalism is international socialism. And if you oppose globalism, you're a hater, a bigot, a racist, a proponent of white supremacy, Christian supremacy, and on the side of the demons. Those that embrace a Judeo-Christian worldview are now openly declared enemies that are stopping the progress of mankind. As we will discuss, this is very similar to the ways Christianity and Judaism was described in Nazi Germany. Yet, this time it is happening on a global scale and at conferences attended by so-called religious leaders, lawmakers, and representatives of the United Nations. Here is an interview I conducted with Carl Teichrib and Alex Newman. Both are experts on globalism and are frequent attendees at international conferences on globalism. Tonight on the Worldview Weekend Hour, Carl Tycrib joins me. He has returned from a conference that's calling for globalism, world government, and using religion to accomplish that goal. And who do you think the enemies are? Conservatives and people of the Christian faith. Carl, thank you for joining us. Thank you for uh, letting me come in and be a part of the program. So tell me about this conference you went to in 2018. What was it called? Where was it held? What was the theme? What was the purpose? Who was speaking? Oh, the conference I attended in 2018 uh, was called the Parliament of the World's Religions. And the Parliament of the World's Religions is a movement as well as an organization and an event. And it goes back to the first parliament, which took place in 1893, which at that time was an event bringing together religious leaders from around mostly the Western world, envisioning what they believe to be uh, the creation of a, of a new era of global peace and harmony. And in 1993, the parliament reconvened, reconfigured. The last parliament was in 2018 in Toronto, Ontario. The parliament's theme was this, the promise of inclusion, the power of love. And that's important, Brandon, because I have been to 35, maybe 45 international events. I don't think I've ever been to an event that had such open hostility to conservative Christians, to conservative values, uh, certainly very strong hostility to, to Donald Trump, to the Republican Party, to anybody that may have, have an inkling towards accepting nationalism, the free market, all of that was demonized. And I mean that literally, the term demonism, I'm using that literally. In fact, Jim Wallace, one of the speakers at the parliament, made it very clear that, and of course, this was taking place during the US midterm elections, that it was literally an election between the demons and the angels in America. And of course, if you supported the Republicans, you were supporting the demons. Let's go to that audio clip by Jim Wallace. In the election of the United States, the midterm election is nothing less than a referendum on white nationalism in the United States. Now we have a president who is appealing 
to our worst demons. And the demons are right below the surface. The battle now for people of faith is between angels and demons. So Jim Wallace is saying in this 2018 World Religions Conference, a globalist conference, that if you're for nationalism, meaning borders, national sovereignty, not the nationalism of Hitler, that the state is of primary importance, but if you're for nationalism as a, the antithesis of globalism, you're for national sovereignty and borders, vetting those who come into your country, uh, that you're a white supremacist. If you're for capitalism, you're a white supremacist. And that you're actually helping the demons when you are for national sovereignty, border protection, and the free market system, you're on the side of the demons. So again, people need to understand, those who embrace a Judeo-Christian worldview are being set up for persecution with this kind of rhetoric, are they not? Yes, and did you note it, or notice how he said nationalism is the greatest threat of terror in America? So where does that put those who hold to a patriotic position? Keep in mind, Brandon, I'm a Canadian. I'm not an American. I don't vote in your system. And the, the rhetoric and, and the level of animosity we saw at the 2018 Parliament was so real, so visceral, that we approached different people. I was there with some friends. We approached different people, including some of the volunteers who are making the conference happening. And we said, look, this is hypocrisy. This is absolute hypocrisy. The promise of inclusion, the power of love, really? No, this is not. This is a one-sided position. And if you don't agree, you're a demon. So this is a propaganda campaign, an information operation to start setting up those who embrace a Judeo-Christian worldview, which includes the free market principles and national sovereignty. This is an information operation to begin to marginalize, characterize, so that you can vilify and then legalize the vilifying and the persecution of them on a global scale. That's all this is. This is, this is, this is education for what their plans are, which is the legalization of the persecution of those who disagree with their worldview. And the important part for people to realize is that this is out of their own out of their own mouths. This is this is them being, you know, speaking freely in amongst friends, and, and so in those kind of situations, then you're able to see, okay, what is it that you truly believe? What is it that that is of importance to you? And and who do you see as being the problem? And again, at the Parliament of World Religions, Christianity specifically evangelical Christianity was recognized as a problem area. Let's go to our next clip. We, the religions of the world, must stop encouraging plantation capitalism, which is free market capitalism. All right, so I'm not sure who uh, Mr. Lawson is, but uh, James Lawson, but he's saying that they must stop promoting plantation, I mean, uh, policy. Uh, again, using the slavery concept that capitalism is a form of slavery. So again, pretty clear what the World Parliament on Religions for a global uh, government wants. The end of right. capitalism and those who are capitalists to be equated to slave owners, correct? Correct. Keep in mind, James Lawson was a, a leading tactician, theorist, and thinker within the civil rights movement of the 1960s, and is still considered to be a leading figure in progressive left movements. And so his voice was well received at the Parliament of World Religions as he decried capitalism and the free market economy. Here's another clip. This is James Lawson at the Parliament of World Religions that Carl attended in 2018 talking about the greatest threat to America is our free market system that he seeks to change. Listen to this. Number one, I've committed myself to the transformation of my own country because I'm convinced that my own nation, my own government, with the insidious unity the so-called free market, market economy is the number one enemy of truth and justice in the world today. So, Carl, if there's any debate about whether or not they hate the free market system, there it is. Now, folks listening to this may say, well, 
Brandon, Carl, these people are crazy. Nobody listens to them. No one listens to them. Uh, they're talking religion. Uh, they're talking politics. Those things don't mix. No one listens to these guys. They're crazy. True or false? Oh, that, sorry, Brandon. That's absurd. Politics and religion absolutely mix. This is a cult of world order. This is spiritual politics. Who are the people who attended the Parliament of World Religions? Mary Evelyn Tucker from the Yale Forum on, on Religion and Ecology, closely connected in with the Clintons. Karen Hamilton, executive of the World Federalist Movement. Um, Audrey Kitagawa, a former UN advisor. Christina Figueres, who was the former executive secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. She was the architect of the Paris Climate Agreement. She was in attendance. Uh, Jonathan Granoff, the president of the Global Security Institute and a UN special representative. Uh, Ibu Patel, who is Barack Obama's advisory council on faith-based neighborhoods and who is now the, the president of the Chicago-based Interfaith Youth Corps. Uh, Bishop, Larry, or, uh, pardon me, Bishop William Swing, the founder of the United Religions Initiative. The list goes on. We had former Prime Minister of Canada, Kim Campbell, as one of our speakers. David Corden from the Club of Rome, uh, senior Canadian uh, uh, senator, Douglas Roche, who was the former chairperson of the UN Disarmament Committee. This is politics and religion coming together. In fact, the very, the very fact that they're discussing the issue of free markets, nationalism, political discourse within a religious setting demonstrates that politics and religion combine at the international level. And these people are influential in their nations and globally. They're, they, these are not people that are not listened to are plugged in, these are thought leaders that politicians and lawmakers are following, and some of them are lawmakers. Absolutely. All right, this next guy at the World Parliament says the Southern Baptist Convention, which is the largest Protestant denomination in America and largely in the South, uh, they need to work on their white supremacy problem. Again, what they're doing here is equating people in the South who are for free market principles, who are hold to uh, the Judeo-Christian worldview ethic, they're equating the Southern Baptist Convention and conservatives in the South with white supremacy. Listen to this from the World Parliament of Religions that Carl attended in 2018. Just the Southern Baptists should be working on their white supremacy problem, and they're not, if they cared about diversity and the millions of black people throughout the South and the entire country population, then they would be making efforts to repent and repair the damage they've caused, but they're not even acknowledging it. So I think our religious allies, if you want us to trust you, you need to start standing up against your Christian brethren and challenge Christian supremacy. It's being written into the laws again in this country. The most extremist Christian strictures are being written into the laws of the land and imposed on everyone. So he's equating people who believe in the scriptures are Christians, Protestant Christians, Southern Baptist, white supremacy, Christian supremacy. He got them all in right there, didn't he? Yes, he did. That was a theme repeated throughout the event. Again, keep in mind that the theme was the power of love, the promise of inclusion. But what did that look like? I can give you a, a visual just to show, again, the hypocrisy of the position that the parliament was in. During the course of the week, a Baptist minister was uh, building a Buddhist sand mandala of... Uh, Kali, the deity of death and destruction, holding the severed head of Justice Kavanaugh and having a ring of severed heads uh, around Kali's belt of those who confirmed Justin Kavanaugh out of anger and the anger that this Baptist minister had to the Republicans and to Justin Kavanaugh in particular. And so it, it's a graphic picture. A, and, and again, interfaithism in the sense of she's a Buddhist. And it was, she was a, a pardon me, is a Baptist minister using a Buddhist Santa Mandela technique to create an image of Kali, the god of death and destruction, holding the severed head of Justice Kavanaugh. So the this power feminist of love. So this feminist globalist uh, Baptist pastor was was portraying this 
at a conference is supposedly promoting love, but people say, well, how can they do that? Because I guess it goes back to Herbert Marcuse, the cultural Marxist Herbert Marcuse, who declared that in his 1965 paper, Repressive Tolerance, the way to deal with the Christians and conservatives is to be more intolerant than they are, deny them freedom of speech and freedom of religion and uh, the ability of assembly. So he said, we have to be more intolerant than they are. So reality is they see their intolerance ultimately as being loving because this is the only way to deal with the problem and the, and the ones who are the, the terrorists, the white supremacists, as we're hearing, is to be more intolerant than they are. So ultimately, the, the way that they can justify this in the name of love is because they're destroying their opposition and the opposition to global government and peace and unity and a heaven on earth by destroying the conservatives and the Christians and the people that are against them. And it ultimately, isn't that a loving thing to do? Destroy those who are stopping the real love from flowing? That's how they justify it, correct? Yes, yes. It reminds me of a, of a old communist maximum. Peace is the destruction of all opposition. There is no place for exclusivism in religion or in politics or in our world. It has arguably been the single greatest source of suffering throughout history. Religious exclusivism, the belief that my truth is the only truth, violates the core spiritual tenets of all beliefs. The claim of exclusive knowledge of the truth is, in a religious sense, idolatry, in a political sense, extremism, and in a psychological sense, narcissism. All right, this fits really well what he just said with our section in this docu-movie Siege on weaponizing psychology, where you portray Christians as crazy. And he said, you're crazy, you're narcissistic, you've got real problems if you believe in what Jesus said to be true in John 14, 6. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father except through me. If you believe in the exclusivity of Jesus Christ, you are a racist, you're a bigot, you're narcissistic, you're mentally unstable, and you are one of the greatest threats to the world. Again, this is where they're going to go with hate crime laws. And this is what is being worked on with the United Nations and with the blasphemy laws. And the Marxist and the Islamist are working together on blasphemy laws that will shut down Christians and prosecute Christians who proclaim the truth of the scriptures, such as Jesus is the way to salvation. If you do that, you are now not only uh, a threat, a terrorist, you're a narcissist. So again, they're going to use these things to weaponize psychiatry, to label Christians as crazy, but also to prosecute them through hate crime laws on a global scale. And they're already working on this at many levels in many nations at the United Nations. And you just heard the guy say that. True or false, Carl? Yes, and if you hold to an exclusivist worldview, an exclusivist religious claim, you are a narcissist, you are an extremist, and you are dangerous. That is, that is the message as being betrayed. Instead, the way now to salvation and harmony and oneness is the way forward as, as religions come together, along with politics, to create a new world, a new vision, a new salvation story. And this is why we end up with laws in places like Canada, where if you say anything that is offensive to the Islamist, you can get kicked off air, fined, or go to jail. And these, this uh, hate crime laws or fairness doctrine and other laws like that, they're going to start shackling not only the pulpits, but the airwaves for any conservative radio or Christian radio. I'll make sure people, understand, sure people understand what I just said. I'm not talking about just religious radio. This will have an impact on conservative talk radio as well. Correct, Carl? Absolutely. It's happening already. You already see on social media, uh, on the World Wide Web, that if you say certain things, if you, if you uphold certain positions, certain conservative positions, you may find that your post goes down, your, your YouTube site gets shut down. Uh, all of a sudden, you might find yourself basically put in uh, Internet jail. So at a very basic level, and that it's still an important level. It's the issue of free speech. It's the issue of being able to present your side. Already you are seeing conservatives and Christians finding that their voice is becoming increasingly marginalized and pushed to the side. And I think what's so crucial is for folks to understand that what's happening now, ba uh, blacklisting, banning, uh, kicking you off Twitter, Facebook, whatever, that's just a taste of what's to come. We already hear what major policy uh, folks are saying at the Parliament for World Religions, and they, they are working with lawmakers. Many of them are making the laws. They're writing the laws. We have just heard what they want to do. They want to set up Christians and conservatives 
as being the source of all suffering and oppression. Karl Marx said, my object in life is to dethrone God and destroy capitalism. Frederick Nietzsche declared Christianity the one greatest uh, curse of all mankind. Freud believed that Christians were insane. So you see the thought leaders of the Frankfurt School, Frederick Nietzsche, Sigmund Freud, Karl Marx, all hating Christians, all hating capitalists, all hating the free market system, all hating conservatives. And what do you hear at the Parliament of World Religions where they're supposedly teaching love? That the threat to love is those who speak truth and are for, for the free market system. They're terrorists, they're white supremacists, they're narcissistic, they're psychologically unbalanced. This is all gonna be done on a global scale in the framework of politics and religion and economics, and they're coming after conservatives and people of faith, which is what the Frankfurt School said. The source of all suffering and oppression are Christians and capitalists. I'm not sure we can stop what's coming, but I think we might be able to slow it down. And one of the ways to slow it down is to counter their lie with the truth. And that's what we've done. Right. Would, you agree, would you agree with that statement? Absolutely, we need to counter with the truth. There is, there is no question about that. That is essential. And, and Brandon, that is our responsibility as well, to be able to present the truth of liberty and the truth of freedom in the face of what we see taking place. The globalists are very aware that currently they cannot convince enough Americans or others throughout the world to openly surrender to socialism or communism. Thus, masking terms such as environmentalism, environmental justice, sustainability, or climate change are used to rename their real agenda of international socialism and global governance. To further hide socialism, or to at least present it as being compatible with free markets, socialism is being merged with capitalism for what is called a third way, public-private partnerships, or communitarianism. These are all masking terms for what is really communism light. It is also known as corporate fascism, which is the merging of big government and big business. The opposition to this corporate fascism is the free market system and individual rights that include private property. This global plan of international socialism, mixing socialism with capitalism or communitarianism, was originally known as Agenda 21, and originated at the United Nations. As you will see and hear, President George H. Bush eagerly assisted in surrendering America's free market system, private property rights, and sovereignty to this global UN plan. Tom DeWeese explains how this global system of tyranny is being implemented and branded in such a manner that most Americans will not recognize the threat and not become opposition to its implementation. Joining me is Tom DeWeese. Tom, welcome to the broadcast. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Brandon, thanks for having me. Tom, you've been fighting this battle, what, 25 or more years? About 27 years, this particular issue, yes. Mm -hmm. And as I said, when we started talking about Agenda 21, sustainable development, we got a lot of criticism, conspiracy theories, whatnot. Uh, yet those things have now come to pass from the United Nations. Not only the United Nations, many states here in America are now involved. Not only are the states involved, many of the local governments are involved. And they're involved with global agencies, what are called NGOs, non-government organizations. They're involved with organizations tied all the way back to the United Nations. For those maybe who don't know, how would you define sustainable development? Sustainable development is a process by which uh, our, uh, everything is based on protecting the environment. That's the excuse that's used for uh, every policy that's put in place under sustainable development. And uh, this becomes a very uh, useful tool for those who want to put these things in place because the uh, environment doesn't follow political boundaries. So you have national boundaries, you have state boundaries, you have uh, community boundaries, you have the boundaries around your own property. But rivers run through several different states, several different counties. Uh, you have, uh, you know, all the uh, all kinds of different environmental uh, pathways that don't fit that. So that makes it very simple when they want to put uh, sustainable policies in place 
that you're saying, well, this is my property, or here we're going to have to create a whole new situation for your community. Well, but the environment always becomes the excuse. And that's what they, they came up with from the very beginning when they brought in uh, Agenda 21 in 1992 and said it was a comprehensive blueprint for the reorganization of human society. That was the way they defined it. And when you're talking about completely reorganizing human society, uh, you know what, what is the most powerful message they could use to do that? The threat of environmental Armageddon. Doesn't matter how many rights you think you have uh, if you don't have a planet to stand on. So that's the very basis of all this. And now it's seeped into every single community in this country. Comprehensive development plans you're hearing everywhere. Uh, and we are seeing attacks on private property. We're seeing a, a complete restructuring of uh, even our system of government as, as this is being put into place. You mentioned 1992. That was the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. Each individual person is precious and the planet must honor and support all its children but overall this growth cannot continue population must be stabilized and rapidly the wasteful and destructive lifestyles of the rich cannot be maintained at the cost of the lives and livelihoods of the poor and of nature and we have a video clip of president George H. Bush proudly announcing that America signed on to this globalist agenda connected to the United Nations, Stephen Rockefeller, Miguel Gorbachev, Maurice Strong. Secretary General Boutrous Ghali, and my gratitude to Secretary General Maurice Strong for his tireless work in bringing this Earth Summit together. This is truly an historic gathering. We come to Rio prepared to continue America's unparalleled efforts to preserve species and habitat. And let me be clear, our efforts to protect biodiversity itself will exceed, will exceed the requirements of the treaty. And then Bill Clinton, of course, as president, made sure that a lot of these government agencies were working in lockstep with this globalist UN plan, correct? That's absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. They, uh, they signed on to it. I mean, there were 179 world leaders there. There were 50,000 delegates all, all together. And, they, uh, and most of them were these NGOs that you mentioned earlier, Sierra Club, Nature Conservancy, Audubon Society, these people that have private agendas. And they uh, become sanctioned by the United Nations to be a non-governmental organization. Then they are able to work behind the scenes in all these meetings and put these, these documents together. So here you had them. You had 179 world leaders. You had uh, diplomats, uh, so forth. 50,000 of them came together to declare we're going to put together the agenda for the 21st century. And as I said, comprehensive blueprint for the reorganization of human society. It's what they did. You know, I wrote, as you might know, this book, Grave Influence, in 2008. It came out in 2009. And a big section of this book was on sustainable development. For those who maybe don't know or don't remember, how would you define sustainable development? Particularly since you're going to many of the United Nations uh, conferences. And I know sustainable development largely came out of the Earth Summit in the early 90s. Well, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And I was at the UN Conference on Sustainable Development in Rio de Janeiro in 2012. That was exactly 20 years after their original Earth Summit where they came out with Agenda 21. And uh, they had a picture there that was probably worth a million words. It, had, it was an anthropomorphic Earth. So it was you know, an Earth with a, a face, a human face, and it had a, a thermometer sticking out of its mouth. It was very clearly uh, ill. You know, it had a, a fever and everything. And the doctor comes in this poster and says, I know your problem. You have humans. And I think that perfectly encapsulates this UN ideology called sustainable development. It's basically, you know, take what God told people in Genesis, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth, flip it exactly upside down, don't be fruitful, don't even think about multiplying, and subduing the earth is completely out of the question. You might hurt a lizard or, or a, you know, a cockroach or something, don't even think about it. And I think that really encapsulates sustainable development. It is, it is essentially a recipe for global totalitarianism masquerading as an environmental program. And, you know, officially they say, well, it's just to ensure that we have enough resources and we don't uh, hurt the planet for future generations. But really, when you read through their own documents, this is obviously a, just a pretext to restrict freedom, 
undermine the nation state and move us toward this one world order that at this point they openly talk about. But when you actually read their documents, they're quite transparent that this is really socialism. Is, this is globalism. Take, for example, the Agenda 2030. They tell you right in there that we need uh, wealth redistribution at the national and the international level. They say that we need the wealth to be cooperatively shared. They say that we need to uh, use the education system to bring all of this about. And so uh, I, I, there's a really great term that's been floating around for a few years now, the, the idea that these people are watermelons. Uh, they're green on the outside, but they're red on the inside. So what we're talking about here is international socialism, uh, but they're using the environment as the a marketing, the branding for world government, correct? Sure. If they had come out and said, we're going to put together world government, we're going to put together world socialism, that would have been rejected. But when they, again, use this excuse of environmental disaster, and of course climate change became the, uh, the, you know, the real uh, effective tool in that, started out as global warming, but then, golly, things started getting colder. So, well, now climate change. So anything that happens in the climate now fits their mold, uh, you know, to, to put it all in place. So, yeah, this is, uh, this is why they came up with that, because it was much more effective than saying, well, we're all going to become uh, little socialists. And this then is why you have people like the congresswoman from New York now, AOC, Alexander... Uh, Cortez. Catesia Cortez declaring that uh, if we don't do something about this crisis, we're going to all die in 12 years. That's what she said in 2019. Millennials and people and, you know, Gen Z and all these folks that come after us are looking up and we're like, the world is going to end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. And your biggest issue is your your biggest issue is how are we going to pay for it? And like this is the war this is our world war ii and i believe quite frankly that uh they have used this uh, naive little girl from new york uh, uh you know to promote this thing bring it out become a media sensation with it uh the established politicians wouldn't touch it it was so radical but so they give it to her and she's become this uh media sensation over it you may not really again understand what sustainable development is all about in my book religious trojan horse i on page 230 uh, 257 described all the things that sustainable development will bring us abortion on demand population control gun control social justice global governance the new world order their their words not mine we have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order a world where the rule of law not the law of the jungle governs the conduct of nations when we are successful and we will be we have a real chance at this new world order an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. George H.W. Bush went on national television and announced to the world that he was building a, quote, new world order, and then he defined it for us. He said it would be a world in which a credible United Nations would use its peacekeeping role to bring about the vision of the UN's founders. And if you unpack that, he let the cat out of the bag. Um, you know, he's talking about the UN's peacekeeping role, really they're talking about the UN's military forces. Um, estimates from the group here, their cries suggest that these UN peace troops have raped something along the order of 60,000 women and children just in the last decade. So these are not peace troops. These are war-making, atrocity-committing uh, people with heavy weaponry wearing uh, little blue helmets. And so George Bush said, we're going to use this peacekeeping role to bring about the vision of the U.N.'s founders. And we know quite a bit about the U.N.'s founders. This is not a mystery. Uh, we know, for example, that they were openly plotting the creation of a world government. Uh, we have John Foster Dulles as one example, a crucial architect of the United Nations, served as Secretary of State. And he wrote in his book, War or Peace, uh, you know, there's no proposal for a world government that couldn't be brought about using the existing UN Charter. Uh, on the other side, we had Joseph Stalin, who of course was very interested in creating a world government as well, a communist, uh, brutal, totalitarian world government. 
And then on our side, you know, to come back to the United States, we sent a guy called Alger Hiss, and they loved him so much, they actually made him the uh, first secretary general of the UN and of the conference that created the UN. And a few years later, we put him in federal prison because he was a spy for Joseph Stalin. So why Bush would talk openly about building a new world order based on the vision of these UN founders instead of respecting the vision of our American founders uh, is, you know, to me, just absolutely flabbergasting. And, and then for someone to come along and say, that's a conspiracy theory, no, 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 all you need to do is go to YouTube and watch George Bush say this, or you can watch Bill Clinton say it. He said, I agree with George Bush on the need for a new world order, or Joseph Biden, or Henry Kissinger, or Prime Minister Tony Blair, or, you know, pick, take your pick of world leaders. You have George Soros, just in recent years, has been running around the world saying we need, quote, a new world order, and that communist China ought to own the new world order in the same way that the United States owned the old world order. So these people are now very open about this and again i think it goes back to the fact that they're so confident of success because they've got all our kids in their classrooms socialized medicine also known as single payer universal health care uh, which then will mean the rationing of health care which means euthanasia social welfare programs elimination of private property elimination of national sovereignty elimination of parental authority elimination of free market capitalism education to serve the masses public housing redistribution of wealth legal positivism and judicial activism. Legal positivism is applying moral relativism to the law. Not that there are absolute truths for all people, all time, and all places, but we make it up as we go along. Society evolves, morals evolve, the law evolves. And this, of course, is how you end up having the law evolve to the point you're legalizing the marginalizing, characterizing, and uh, persecution of conservatives, or Christians, or Jews. And then you have hate crime laws that criminalize the speaking of truth by conservatives or people of faith. This all is what is made up in sustainable development or Agenda 21, now called Agenda 2030. True or false, Tom DeWeese? Absolutely true. It is, again, go back to reorganization of human society. What you just described is that total reorganization and how to do it. And what, we, what we're seeing now these programs are in every single community in this country. Uh, I, I dare say, everyone, I, don't, I can't think of any. They're not at least trying to put pieces and parts of this in there. And one of, one of the programs they use is called Smart Growth. And you will hear this in, in, if, you, if you go to your city hall, you'll hear them talking about Smart Growth. What Smart Growth does, it, uh, first of all, it puts an artificial line around the community. And it says no growth will take place outside of this line. These are no growth boundaries. Why? Because uh, to, to continue to build outside of that line creates urban sprawl. That means people have to have cars. So, uh, and and then, then the next thing they do is build housing developments, and then they build strip malls to service them. Now, we used to call that building an economy. It created jobs, private property, uh, you know, live, making choices of, of your own life. But now that has become racist. We're not allowed to have that anymore. This, this, first of all, it's damaging the, the uh, environment uh, because we're driving our cars farther and farther out. We're going to stop doing that. So we have our line around the community. And inside, now what happens? Well, first of all, single-family homes, there's no room for them because what's going to happen when you put the line around the city? The population begins to grow, but the, the city doesn't. The only place you have is to go up. First of all, there's no room for single-family homes uh, because there's no room for those yards and that sort of thing. And uh, the city of Minneapolis, the mayor has declared that zoning to protect single-family homes is racist, that these people are self-segregating themselves from other people in society. They don't want to live in their neighborhood. Uh, this is the argument they're using in Minneapolis right now. The uh, Speaker of the House of uh, Oregon State Legislature has taken up the same argument, saying we have a housing crisis, uh, a shortage of housing, they're calling it, and we don't have room for single-family homes. We have too many people. What they start to put together in all this is the uh, stack-and-pack high-rises, and what happens is they go higher and higher because that's the only place you have to go. Well, eventually, you know, uh, science says you can't go any higher. The air gets thin. You can't breathe. So what do you do then? Then you begin to cut the size of the apartment. And I've got some documents from an NGO organization in France 
that says that apartments shouldn't be more than 320 square feet. Mm. Step by step by step, this happens. And uh, uh, one of the other things that is happening with, with smart growth, of course, they want you to only have uh, either ride bicycles or walk to work or have uh, light rail trains, public transportation to take you where you're going to go. One of the effects we're seeing happen, uh, landlords, uh, private property landlords. Uh, now, we've already had the attack on single family homes. Now we're looking at uh, landlords who have their own apartment buildings. They begin to raise the taxes on them. They put all kinds of regulations on how they have to cut back on energy use and things that make it much more expensive. Then all of a sudden they say, well, golly, people shouldn't have to pay high rents for all that. We're going to put rent control on there because it's only fair. What happens to the landlords? They go out of business. What you now have, no private property rights uh, or private property at all, and no private companies that are running these things. Everything becomes government housing. And that is the goal of sustainable development, that government controls all of it. And how does this destroy the lives of the lower income and the ethnic residents? The, uh, one of the things that happens with the eminent domain that is, is used to do this, you, you have these NGOs and your city councilmen, county commissioners sitting in back rooms, pretty much mapping out the community, how we're going to reorganize and that goes into that comprehensive plan. And uh, what they're uh, saying in, in here is, well, we're going to take this neighborhood over here. It's a low income neighborhood or an ethnic neighborhood. And we're going to use eminent domain and we're going to take out the buildings and we're going to make a beautiful new uh, place there, uh, upscale. You, know, you see this sign, this word a lot used. And but there are people living there who have their own homes. They have a private home. There are people there who have small businesses, mom and sh uh, pop uh, uh, restaurants and uh, things like that, maybe a laundromat, whatever it might be. Well, now as they come through with a bulldozer, all of those are dead. I have yet to see one community say, we've got uh, this really great Italian restaurant, for example, that, that, that thrives down there, and we're going to redo the whole neighborhood, and we're going to really make a nice facility for that restaurant to come in, and it'll, and it'll grow, and the, the people who own it will get richer from it and, and be more prosperous. No, they bulldoze all that down. Those people who are living there can no longer afford to live in the neighborhood that they used to because of what they've done. They are forced onto welfare programs, forced into public housing. Their businesses are dead. And uh, if there are now in the new section, new restaurants and things like that, these are global corporations that are acting in partnership, public-private partnerships with the government to now be the businesses in there. This is the way they destroy these people. They are now in public uh, welfare, public housing. They, their life as choosing their own life of their own is over. So government bureaucrats working with big corporations for planned developments that destroy the free market mom and pop businesses that are pure capitalist for the government, big government, uh, big corporation model, which is really socialism mixed with capitalism, or what Henry L Lamb, who's passed away now, Henry Lamb uh, used to call uh, communitarianism, uh, communism light. So it has the flair of being, uh, you know, here's a restaurant, i.e. these must be capitalist, but it is a government, big government, big corporation model that did this plan community that put the real capitalist and mom and pop out of business to give us this mixture of government and corporations working together for what is called the third way or communitarianism or the public-private partnership, correct? That is a very, very important point to make on this because you've got kids coming out of public schools who are told that this is capitalism and look how evil capitalism is. It ruined my parents, you know, our, our neighborhood and all that. They would begin to believe that. There is nothing here that is capitalism. In capitalism, uh, you have competition. In this, you don't have competition. These public-private partnerships, there, uh, you know, th th there is no uh, contracts put in there. That, you know, that you you have to submit and and then have a competition for the contract, anything like that. These are no bid contracts, that kind of thing. And uh, th what happens is the government gets to hide behind the independence of the business. So this is what a public-private partnership is. There is absolutely no free enterprise whatsoever in that model. 
this is right out of the Mussolini model of fascism. It's corporate fascism is what it is. It's, again, big yes. government, big business working in concert together for what, what I write about in my book in 1995, Reclaiming a Nation at Risk. I was predicting corporate fascism coming to America in 1995, my book. People were laughing. And yet here we are, and this again is happening. Tom? Absolutely. I, I wrote, as you know, a series of articles on these things. I put them together in my first book and titled it, Now Tell Me I Was Wrong, <laughs> for the very same reason, because I took the same heat you did, and uh, that's what they did. They had to discredit us as we were telling people the truth of what was happening. And now uh, here we are, 20-some years later, and the truth is coming out, and we are right. We're calling the gas that we exhale, carbon dioxide, a toxic pollution that needs to be regulated and taxed by the United Nations. That's how extreme this has gotten. And environmentalism, again, is just a, a pretext for bringing about this vision that they have. In fact, they even admit that. The Commission on uh, Global Governance, an organization tied to the United Nations, I quote them in my book, Grave Influence, from 2008, and here's what they wrote. Quote, the environment, perhaps more than any other issue, has helped to crystallize the notion that humanity has a common future. The concept of sustainable development is now widely used and accepted as a framework within which all countries, rich and poor, should operate. The aspect that particularly concerns us is the global governance implications, end quote. So there is the Commission on Global Governance aligned with the United Nations, admitting they're using sustainable development as the framework for bringing about global governance. In other words, radical environmentalism, sustainable development, Agenda 21, now called Agenda 2030, is simply using that to bring about world government. And that's exactly, exactly what's happening. And again, when you read their documents, you just see this so clearly. Uh, a lot of the people who've been pushing this have also been very open about admitting this. You know, I, I quote uh, David Rockefeller often. He wrote in his memoirs, uh, the late David Rockefeller, you know, he went to go uh, meet his maker a couple years ago. And I can't imagine that went very well, but you know, that's uh, between him and God. But he wrote in his memoirs before he died, uh, some people accuse me of being a conspirator, uh, con working with other internationalists, a secret cabal of internationalists around the world against the best interests of my own country to build a one world order with an integrated global economy and political system. And he said, if that's the charge, I'm proud of it. Uh, what you see is they all have this idea in common that, hey, we need to globalize political problems and environmental problems as a pretext to bring about this one world order. So, you know, the climate change issue is so perfect for them because what they say is, hey, climate change doesn't respect borders. This is a global problem. And when you have a global problem, you need to have global political solutions. So it is uh, very transparently a pretext. They don't even bother to conceal it anymore. And if we allow them to get their way on this, it will be the end of freedom and the end of America as we have known it. Absolutely. Maurice Strong, who helped her head up the Earth Summit in Rio in 1992, said this, quote, Isn't the only hope for the planet that the industrialized civilizations collapse? Isn't it our responsibility to bring that about? End quote. And then here we have this, quote, It is simply not feasible for sovereignty to be exercised unilaterally by individual nation states, however powerful. It is a principle which will yield only slowly and reluctantly to the imperatives of global environmental cooperation, In quote. There's Marie Strong of the Earth Summit again saying, we're going to use environmentalism to bring about world government. Or how about Helen Kalkakut of the Union of Concerned Scientists when she declared, quote, free enterprise really means rich people get richer. They have the freedom to exploit and psychologically rape their fellow human beings in the process. Capitalism is destroying the earth, end quote. Again, coming out of my book, Grave Influence, from 2008. So now that we see this millennial generation uh, fully indoctrinated through our educational system into global warming myths and other junk science, no wonder someone like uh, AOC or the U.S. Congresswoman from New York, Cortez, as her name is, Cortez, no wonder she can gain such a humongous following on social media and this is the future of our elected officials because they've been brainwashed in our schools to buy into this trash. It, that is exactly what we're dealing with right now. And if you look at the polls, uh, you know, the latest polls show a majority of young Americans support socialism over free markets. Uh, this is a very dangerous trend. It's getting worse. It's happening around the world. Of course, the U.N. is now involved in education all over the world. And, you know, 
the kind of global government that they're looking for, the kind of global system that they're indoctrinating children to accept, is very transparently totalitarian. Uh, you know, to, to go back to this UN uh, Conference on Sustainable Development that I went to in Rio de Janeiro, I mean, they didn't bother to hide it. The, the chairman of the conference was literally a Chinese communist. His name was Shah Zakung, a representative of the most murderous dictatorship to ever curse this planet, uh, the, the mass murdering regime in China, which murdered 80 million of its own citizens at least, not including the maybe hundreds of millions that they've murdered through forced abortions and uh, coercive population control policies. So why would you put somebody like that in charge of the summit that's supposed to plan out the global environmental government? And you know, to add insult to injury here, Brandon, if you look around the world, there is a very, very clear link between environmental problems and totalitarian government. If you look at the most polluted nations in the world, you have the former Soviet Union, you have North Korea, you have communist China, you have Cuba. These are absolute wastelands, right? They've destroyed entire ecosystems with their failed central planning, with their harebrained ideas. And then you look at the cleanest societies, the most environmentally friendly societies on the planet. And without exception, they are all the most free market oriented economies in the world, like Switzerland, parts of Western Europe, Japan, the United States, Canada. I mean, these are the countries that have had free markets or at least more free market than, than these other states. And they are by far the cleanest. So under the guise of improving the environment, we're now moving toward a global model that has been shown consistently and repeatedly to be an absolute destroyer of the environment. So they really take us for fools. And I think the only reason they can get away with this is because they have the children in the schools. Agenda 2030 is really in part global Nazi ecology masquerading as environmentalism. Dr. Mark Musser is the author of the book, Nazi Ecology, and has documented that the Nazi Holocaust was largely a green Holocaust that elevated nature over man, declared that the Judeo-Christian worldview was the source of all suffering and oppression, and was also holding up the evolutionary advancement of man and nature. Capitalism was declared evil and those that embrace capitalism with their belief that God intended for nature to serve man instead of man to serve nature were to be exterminated through eugenics and ultimately the Nazi Holocaust. Hitler was a radical environmentalist and vegetarian. Marriages performed by the Nazi state frequently included blessings of Mother Earth and Father Sky. Hitler believed in reincarnation and even convinced SS officers that by murdering millions of Jews and other, quote, undesirables, end quote, they were allowing them to get on with the reincarnation process and come back more quickly in an advanced status. A Holocaust survivor named Viktor Frankl explained that the philosophical foundation for the slaughter was laid down by those who taught evolution and the nihilism of Friedrich Nietzsche that declared that life had no ultimate meaning, or what one wills determines what is right. Victor writes, quote, the gas chambers of Auschwitz were the ultimate consequence of the theory that man is nothing but the product of heredity and environment, or as the Nazis like to say, of blood and soil. He said, I'm absolutely convinced that the gas chambers of Auschwitz, Treblanka, and Maidenek were ultimately prepared not in some ministry or other of Berlin, but rather at the desks and in the lecture halls of nihilistic scientists and philosophers." End quote. Nihilism holds that there is no supreme judge and that life has no meaning aside from the state's purposes. Sadly, many leftists have rewritten history and the murder of 11 million people by the Nazis has not been properly or historically taught as the pagan environmental sacrifices that they were. Dr. Musser brings history back into focus when he reveals these facts. Quote, there is a luxuriant oak tree standing just outside the gated entrance into Auschwitz Camp 1, where the sign reads, work makes you free. In fact, there are many stately oaks inside the camp and just outside the entrance. There were also oak trees in the immediate proximity of a few of the gas chambers and crematorium as well. More ominous, 
the gas chamber doors at both Auschwitz and Treblanka were made of solid oak. At Auschwitz, the Nazis made double oak doors that sealed the sacrificial fate of all the victims when they were shut. The intimate proximity of such oak symbolism to concentration and death camps like Auschwitz and Treblanka is not likely to be merely coincidental. There was a certain method to the Nazi madness. No matter how industrial the gas chambers may have been so often characterized, the ancient symbolism of human sacrifice being practiced under the oak trees bleeds through the veneer of Nazi modernism. Dr. Musser also writes, quote, the weakness of the modern Western world were presented to have its crumbling foundations within the long-standing influences of the Judeo-Christian tradition, with the Jews in particular being at the very core of the problem. The green sacrifice of the Jews would therefore be required to help the European world return back to nature and her eugenic racial laws of evolutionary development that the Judeo-Christian worldview interrupted." End quote. Dr. Musser continues writing, quote, In his youth, while attending architectural school in Vienna in 1908, Adolf Hitler wrote up a play about religious sacrifices centering on the differences between Christianity and German paganism. Hitler was clearly very aware of the practices of religious sacrifice under the oak trees in ancient paganism, end quote. Did you get all that? The Jews were murdered in part because they were seen as the source of capitalism. And being the environmentalist, socialist, and corporate fascist that he was, Hitler hated capitalism. The Nazis also despised the Jews for not being Aryan. When the Nazi worldview was mixed with Darwinian evolution, Friedrich Nietzsche's Superman concept, and Hitler's anti-Semitism, the final solution to this perceived capitalistic, environmental, and genetically inferior overpopulation was a pagan sacrificial extermination. Hitler believed such a sacrifice to the gods would increase the power and fertility of the German people as they sought world domination. Here is an interview I recently conducted with Mark Musser on his excellent book, Nazi Ecology. Tonight on the Worldview Weekend Hour, part two in our series with Dr. Mark Musser, author of Nazi Ecology. We'll look tonight at the origins of sustainable development going all the way back to Adolf Hitler and Nazism. Sustainable development, Agenda 21, now called Agenda 2030. Would you be surprised to find out it has Nazi roots, radical environmentalism, green energy, animal rights, and the destruction of the Judeo-Christian ethic worldview? All stems from the green holocaust of the Nazi party. The Worldview Weekend Hour begins right now. Here is your host, Brandon House. Welcome, my friends, to the program. Glad you're with us. It's the Worldview Weekend Hour. I'm Brandon House. And again, my guest is Mark Musser. Mark, welcome back to the broadcast. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an honor. We honor. did an hour of television. We did an hour of live radio. Now we're back to television. And we had a great first uh, uh, hour of TV, but we discussed some things that I think need to have a quick review just to bring everybody up to speed or to remind them if they even saw the last broadcast. We talked about the various stages that have brought us to where we are, looking at what happened in Europe and in Germany. And we started out with romanticism, the idea of a relationship with uh, nature, feelings, romanticism, uh, a worship of nature or a relationship with nature, pantheism, all is God, panentheism, God is in all. Then that led to the philosophy of existentialism, something that Nietzsche was into, the will to power. Mm -hmm. There's really no ultimate meaning in life, no absolute truth. The will, the will determines what's true. The, w the will determines what's true. Mm -hmm. So there's no absolute truth. Right. So whatever the will wants, the will gives, the will which is what determines truth. Yeah, exactly. And then we went for, so we went from romanticism to existentialism. Feelings determine truth. Really Feelings. Well, determine truth. And that's really postmodernism today. Truth and reality well, created by man, not yeah. by God, which is what Nietzsche taught. Yes. So romanticism, existentialism, Darwinian evolution. Uh, the, now we base it on fact, you know, the, the fact that 
biology and evolutionary theory, those things came together to mix with socialism and with politics, and that becomes dynamite. So a social Darwinianism. Yeah, social Darwinism. Where so everything's evolving, everything's changing, yeah. we got to evolve and get better. That means we got to redefine marriage, can't stu stay stuck with a Judeo-Christian ethic. And then ethic. socially, they, they have an idea of progressivism along with it, and the state will help develop the biology of the nation properly. So the state becomes the... Uh, the, the, the vehicle to use. Of everything. Yes. Yeah. The, the state is of primary importance. Mm -hmm. The state. Yes. Not the family, not individuality, not individual rights. The state. But the state. The state is worshipped, yes. And that all comes out of Sar Dar uh, social Darwinianism. Right. Then we moved into the idea of uh, nihilism. Life has no ultimate meaning or purpose, that, which is no wonder that... we that, see in the last 500 years. <laughs> which is no <laughs> wonder we have so many young people today struggling with anxiety and depression and suicide. Life has no ultimate meaning or purpose. Why are we here? It doesn't mean anything. You, right. I mean, you evolve from pond scum life has no ultimate purpose or meaning and so no wonder they're so depressed it's part of our death culture and the suicide culture is along with it so we have a death culture there's too many people uh, fed to us by environmentalism all the time this is rooted the population control schemes go back to eugenics so you have lots of this kind of stuff going on abortion abortion on demand you know that's part of our death culture they're going to use that to try to trim down the human population part of the eugenics program and then of course you have homosexuality you don't have kids with that so all these things feed into each other mm -hmm. and they relate to each other. So what the Jews and Christians represented wasn't real. It wasn't getting back the, to nature. Right. It was actually everything it's the Jews and the outside. Christians were promoting was outside of mm -hmm. their construct. It comes from heaven, it's no, it does me no earthly good. So as the, as the Christians and the Jews promoted free market capitalism, yeah, that was opposed to their socialism. Mm -hmm. As the Jews and Christians believed in a creator and a mm -hmm. God who created, that destroyed their uh, Evolutionary theory, biology, nature alone. Yes. So everything those the Jews and the Christians were standing for was not authentic, was not real, and was not getting back to nature. Yeah. It was it was absolutely two opposing views. Mm -hmm. So the Christians and the Jews are holding up progress, mm -hmm. and that's what and, and and what they believed was these social constructs that they had created. Yeah, they're false. The, the false that's are social was, yes. constructs of the Jews and the Christians. It's false. It's not real. It's mm -hmm. not authentic. Right. It's not authentic Christianity. It's not authentic uh, the way humans should live. So the Jews and the Christians were the source of all suffering and oppression yeah. with their social constructs. Exactly. Now tell me how that's any different than what the cultural Marxists are saying today. It's not. It's, it's basically, it comes out of the same brew. It's just, it's just a post-World War II, post-modern approach to it all rather than existential and romanticism. It's just an updated version of the same stuff. It so is. the source yeah. of all suffering and oppression is Christianity, capitalism, the Judeo-Christian worldview that marriage between one man and one woman, free market capitalism, uh, the roles of men and women, complementarianism, uh, all of these things are social constructs mm -hmm. that were created by the white Protestant European male and the yes. Jews to oppress people, correct? It's, that's what they think. That's yeah. what they te yeah. teach. Yeah. And this is this is what's being taught today, but in many regards, that's what they were saying back then. That the Pretty Jews much. and the Christians were the source of all suffering and uh, oppression, and that what they believed was not authentic, and we needed to do away with their Judeo-Christian worldview to get back to nature. Yeah, and especially with, uh, they b viewed capitalism as this international capitalism that was like uprooted from, from my own country, and so I need to get rid of this global capitalism because this is alien to me. It places restrictions on me. I have to go to work, you know, and be subjected to some boss that's mean to me, this this kind of stuff. And he, you know, he just takes takes away my life from me. So, All right, yeah. so let's talk about yeah. uh, sustainable development, Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, because Hitler and his crowd were really into Agenda 20, 21 concepts, Agenda 2030, radical environmentalism, green energy, animal rights. And of course, we know that Peter Singer, utilitarianism is what he was into. And utilitarianism is the belief that um, uh, whatever is uh, provides the best uh, outcome, whatever provides the most pleasure over pain, whatever benefits the most people. That's what's uh, defined as utilitarianism. Peter Singer, who's considered one of the fathers of animal rights, mm -hmm. uh, said this, quote, Christianity is our foe. If animal rights is to succeed, w we must destroy the Judeo-Christian religious tradition, In quote. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where we're at today. And yet Hitler was big into animal rights, wasn't yes, he? Yes, and this goes back to Schopenhauer because Schopenhauer was a big animal rights guru. He said very similar things, what you just read. But instead of blaming the Christians, he blamed the Jews. And he said that we need to get rid of uh, Jewish views of nature and animal cruelty. He specifically blamed the Jews for even uh, going so far. This is why science today, for example, does exper experiments on animals. Hmm. So he wanted to do it with that too. And uh, 
Hitler agreed with them, so in 1933 the Nazis passed a very strict animal rights law, uh, which they continued to change over time. And uh, it was um, back in 1934, <laughs> Seattle, my favorite city, uh, my home for my home state, they awarded Hitler the uh, Eichelberger Humane Award for his human rights, humane, you know, animal rights uh, law that he passed. So he wow. was honored by Seattle, Washington. So what, what we have is... Of course, no one talks about that today. We're concerned about animal rights while they're loading Jews onto the trains. That came later. Yeah, so interesting is that they, they used Jews as experimental animals during the, during the war regularly. And then, of course, uh, when they put them on the trains to send them to the death camps, they broke all the animal rights laws that they used for animal transport. And these are on the same train. So they actually have records that Daniel Goldhagen talks about this on the same trains where you had men and women, Jewish people, put on cattle cars, stuffed in cattle cars like, uh, like you know, like fodder. And then uh, the men who did this were chewed out because they were not treating the animals properly. Hmm. Meanwhile, in, in, the, in the trains going to the death camps, how many Jews can fit into a cattle car? Well, one more, see? So they just stuffed them in. So, you know, the irony here is great. And I think the point is, is very, should be well taken is that when you start elevating nature, you invariably diminish man. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no way around this. And once you start diminishing man, there's no bottom to what you can fall into. And, and again, I give the quote yeah. by yes. Peter Singer, Christianity is our foe. Yes. If animal rights is to succeed, we must destroy the Judeo-Christian religious tradition. Notice he got Judeo in there. Now this is the same mm -hmm. Peter Singer who ironically at a big school teaches ethics Yet he talks openly, quote, human babies aren't born self-aware or capable of grasping their lives over time. They're not persons, hence their lives uh, would seem to be no more worthy of protection than the life of a fetus. He goes on to say, quote, we may not want a child to start on life's uncertain voyage if the prospects are clouded, when this can be known at the very early stage in the voyage. We may still have a chance to make a fresh start. This means detaching ourselves from the infant who has been born, cutting ourselves free before the ties that have already begun to bind us to our child have become irresistible. Instead of going forward and putting all our effort into making the best of the situation, we can still say no and start again from the beginning. And what he's talking about is euthanizing, killing a born child, infanticide, and he's doing this, yet he's promoting animal rights, uh, saying we have to destroy the Judeo-Christian ethic for animal rights to succeed. Oh, and by the way, we can kill born children. Now, how is that really any different than what Hitler was doing? Defending animal rights, protecting animals, killing five million uh, Jews, six million, six million, six million Jews. Jews, five million non-Jews, and what do we see today? Again, the, re the same thing going on. We've got to protect the animals, worship nature, environmentalism, but yet we are now got... Uh, infanticide basically legalized now yeah, in 19 yeah. states, no, killing yeah. babies outside the womb. Yeah. And, and the connection is animal rights, utilitarianism, uh, mm -hmm. whatever man decides is best, the most pleasure over pain, whatever mm -hmm. benefits the most people, group consensus. Yes. So as nature has been elevated in our own culture, so then man is diminished. And so you know, these things are d directly related. You, you can't, you start fooling around with this stuff and it leads to nothing but trouble and our society is getting to be very self-destructive, yes. And of course, Jews were blamed for the ecological crisis in Germany. Yes. And Christians today are blamed. In our first program, I yeah. mentioned that, but you found the quote, I think, by Lynn White. So here, Lynn White said this in 1967, Christianity, in absolute contrast to ancient paganism and Asia's religions, not only established a dualism of man and nature, see, God is, and man are separate from nature, and romanticism wants to bring them together again. See, that's the point, Com commune, commune with nature. But also insisted that it is God's will that man exploit nature for his proper ends. By destroying pagan animals, Christianity made it possible to exploit nature in a mood of indifference to the feelings of natural objects. So the notice that uh, natural objects have feelings. That's interesting, romanticism. But as we now recognize something somewhat over a century ago, science and technology, Hitherto, quite separate activities joined to give mankind powers which, to judge by many of the ecological effects, are out of control. If so, Christianity bears a huge burden of guilt. But what uh, he's saying here yeah. is that the ecological crisis is the fault of the yeah. Christians yeah. because we destroyed pagan animism, yeah. the idea of spirit Precisely. beings within nature, right. the worship of nature, which mm -hmm. we discussed in program one. So let's talk about the Holocaust because the Holocaust, in part, was a green Holocaust, correct? To some extent, yes. Uh, you know, social Darwinism is at the root of the Holocaust. And the reason why I talk about a green holocaust is because the same person who is the father of German social Darwinism, his name is Ernst Haeckel, and of course he also loved eugenics. He also is the same man who uh, coined the term ecology in 1866. So what you have, the very foundations of the ecological movement is uh, social Darwinism, biology, and uh, the green movement, you know, 
uh, ecology, all related to each other, the very foundations. I want to make sure our audience has heard what you just said. Yeah. Very important. Mm -hmm. You're saying the man who kind of developed the concept of ecology mm -hmm. was... He coined it. He coined the phrase ecology, mm -hmm. was also big into eugenics. Yeah, he's the father of German social Darwinism, Ernst Haeckel. And now why did he want eugenics? Because eugenics will clean up, clean up uh, the society. And, and who it, needs to be cleaned up? Uh, well, Jews and Christians, primarily Christians. He was anti-Christian. But he also had some anti-Semitic problems as well. But, I mean, he, was it, isn't that what eugenics at the end of the day is about? Yes, a perfect br breeding yeah. and bloodline. Yes, of course. And you don't want to have Christians and Jews breeding because you don't want more of them. You want less of yeah, them. Yeah, you want less of them. And so there's no question that his interest in eugenics is a, is a real problem and his anti-Christian stances are uh, problematic, yes. Mm. All right, so let's talk about the green <laughs> holocaust. What, what does the word holocaust mean? Where does it come from? Holocaust means a uh, whole burnt offering. So it comes from the Greek Old Testament and this is translated from the Hebrew term ola, which means whole burnt offering. So holocaust is sacrificial terminology. It's used in the Old Testament sacrificial system. And so anytime you see a whole burnt offering mentioned in the Old Testament, that word is, in the Greek word, is holocaust. That's where it comes from. What yeah. was the meaning of the holocaust? Yeah, the meaning of the holocaust, I believe, was uh, uh, eugenic operation to bring back Europe back to its natural order. That's the argument essentially summarized in a few words of my, of my book, Nazi Ecology. So they were going to apply uh, politically applied biology to the situation. That means we're going to remove the Jews who are like a bacteria that needs to be cleaned up. And uh, once we cut off the Jews from our society, we can get back to nature, get back to the natural order of things and get back to survival of the fittest and we're gonna be strong again, we're not gonna be weak, we're not gonna be taking care of people like the Jews and Christians have told us to do, and this is gonna help us clean up the blood so we can become healthy and strong again. Which is pretty much the argument today. If we can just get rid of the Christians and the Jews, everything would be right with the world. That seems to be what many people are saying these days. Yes, yes. it is, mm -hmm. all right. So it was a green German Holocaust. Uh, tell me about a green German uh, anti-Semitism. Well, they blame the Jews uh, for a lot of things. Uh, Schopenhauer especially, he blamed the Jews for animal cruelty. Uh, Hitler picked up on that. Why? What, did, what were the Jews doing to the, to the animals? Well, because in Genesis chapter 1, uh, God made man in his image, man's above nature. Adam named all the animals, and so therefore this reason why we don't like animals is because of Genesis chapter 1. And Schopenhauer made a big discussion about this in his philosophical books. And I, I read a lot of similar books in Evergreen State College when I went there in the 1980s where they blamed the Christians, not the Jews, for animal cruelty uh, along similar lines. So uh, I would read books, for example, about how Jesus hated the wolves, you know, because he's protecting the sheep from the wolves and, you know, this kind of stuff. And so I, I just... So it's a false narrative because yeah, the Jews false, don't hate animals no. and we don't hate animals. But what you're saying is it's, 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 it's a false narrative yes. to, to fit their agenda. It's just something to accuse us of so they can pin us on something. What, what don't they accuse the Christians and the Jews of, no, right? No, precisely. We're racist, we're xenophobic, yeah, we're... No, it, we're, it's, I mean, it's yeah, ridiculous. It's, right? yeah, we it's, hate it's, animals, it's we hate nature. Pile of names, we so. don't want to care for nature. Um, so it, it was just... Getting, getting ready to get rid of us. Right. Yeah. And what they used to say that the Jews were um, cruel to animals was their um, kosher diet, correct? That was part of it. And uh, so with the, the Jewish religion, you have to make sure all the blood is taken out of the animal. And in some cases, the, many people in Europe said this is being too cruel to animals in order to get all the blood out. So they criticized the Jews for practicing these kosher slaughter practices. So they, um, and they, Nazi Germany outlawed that practice in 1933. So that was one of the first, they'd taken away the Jewish food supply, basically. So in 1933, they put in a animal rights law. Mm-hmm. Yeah, first of all, it was really almost, targeting the, Jews. the first order of business was a anti-Semitic animal rights law passed in 1933. Oh, Hitler was an animal lover, animal rights guy. So was um, Hess, of course, was too. So Himmler was too. And both Hitler and Himmler didn't like hunting. They thought it was evil. So they, they, they go after the Jews over um, animal rights. Then the next thing you know, they're going after the Jews over the timber trade. Well, they, they had all these. It's just like all the stuff being piled on us. It's the same thing. So, yeah, there's quotations. We have records where... Uh, German Nazis were complaining about the Jews and the timber trade and cutting down the last of the beech trees and you know the walnut trees and you know, th this kind of stuff. You know, it, it was typical. But of yes. course, again, as as businessmen that were maybe involved in the timber yes. trade, right. they were also working in a free market capitalist system. So going after them helped destroy the capitalist free market system as well as it didn't fit in with the German green. Uh, worship of nature mentality. Yeah. So they could they could uh, go after the Jews in their timber trade and take out not only their capitalism, but then 
the, the, the Germans could use that to promote their environmentalism. Yes, no, of course. And, and that's what's happening today, isn't it? Yeah. They're using environmentalism to take out capitalists and Christians yes. who, are, who, by very nature of a Judeo-Christian worldview, are into free market mm -hmm. principles. Let me give you this quote. Quote, yeah. we owe the animals not mercy but justice, and the debt often remains unpaid in Europe, the continent that is permeated with Jews. It is obviously high time in Europe that Jewish values on nature should be expelled from Europe. Get quote. rid of them. Yep. So this is the, uh, this man here is the father of what we call environmental ethics. Anti, super anti-Semite. He said, and quote, he's, this is Hitler's favorite philosopher. He said, quote, the fault lines with the Jewish view, they regard the animal as something manufactured for man's use. Yep. He went on to say, quote, these are the effects of Genesis 1 and generally the whole Jewish way of looking at nature. Yeah. It's amazing. These are amazing quotes. And uh, he believed it, and Hitler loved this guy. What we're really headed toward is Agenda 21, now called Agenda 2030, radical environmentalism, the end of our private property, the persecution of Christian and, and Jews, international socialism. We've seen this before. It was really what was going on with the Nazi Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Very simple. It's just being repackaged. It's just repackaged, and it, it may even be worse before it's all said and done. Yeah, Because uh, it's getting to be so developed now. Things are getting... Uh, well, and we're going to get into that. I mean, they use trains, and they use the gas chamber to get rid of the uh, people that were the source of all suffering and oppression and the blight, the Jews. This bacteria. Yeah, the bacteria. Mm -hmm. This time they're gonna use, I believe, uh, they won't have to use concentration camps per se. I think what they'll use is a, um, a, re a regime of a universal health care, and they'll just euthanize you by <laughs> depriving you of health care. It's looking dangerous. It is. We're, we're living dangerous, serious times. Absolutely, yeah. we'll get into that and more in our next broadcast. Today, the globalists seek world domination. And once again, the capitalist and those that reject the idea that man is to serve nature must be dealt with one way or the other. Sustainable development and radical environmentalism sees man as a blight on the environment. Ironically, they see themselves as gods. But the little people are a blight. Thus, they seek to take away private property from its rightful owners in order to create biospheres and parks or plan communities. The globalists see abortion on demand and euthanasia for population control. Universal health care or socialized medicine must become a reality globally so that the almighty state can determine who is valuable human resource to be preserved through medical care, while those deemed to be the opposition to the global paradigm are quietly and neatly exterminated through the rationing of health care. Sustainable development masks all manner of tyranny, oppression, murder, socialism, and global governance. David Brower, the first executive director of the radical environmentalist organization, the Sierra Club, declared, quote, childbearing should be a punishable crime against society unless the parents hold a government license. All potential parents should be required to use contraceptive chemicals the government issuing antidotes to citizens chosen for childbearing, end quote. Notice, the government will decide who has children. This is very similar to the eugenics of Hitler. In 1977, Paul Eldritch and his wife wrote the book Echo Science with John Holdren. In 2009, Holdren became President Obama's so-called science czar. Mr. and Mrs. Eldritch and John Holdren wrote, quote, it has been concluded that compulsory population control laws, even including laws requiring compulsory abortion, could be sustained under the existing constitution if the population crisis becomes sufficiently severe to endanger society. If some individuals contribute to general social deterioration by overproducing children, and if the need is compelling, they can be required by law to exercise reproductive responsibility." End quote. And of course, by reproductive responsibility, they mean abortion on demand, just like communist China. Sustainable development includes provisions for a world authority that controls all resources and every aspect of human life. Whether they are allowed to be born, how and when they die, and the way they're educated. This system is well underway through the United Nations and Agenda 2030 as they continue their siege on God-given rights. Many Americans do not want to repeat 
the mistakes of past nations that have been ruled by socialist, communist, or fascist dictators. Nor do they want to implement here in America the philosophies of communist China or the former Soviet Union. However, unless Americans educate themselves to the deceptive propaganda and masking terms now advancing Agenda 2030, sustainable development, and globalism, their children and children's children will be left asking, how did this happen? Thank you for watching part three of Siege the DocuMovie.